Certain historic events have not only impacted us as a nation, but have also defined us. One of the most iconic events of the 19th century was the American Civil War, which took place from 1861 to 1865. Ohio alone provided over 200 regiments, and each one of them carried their own distinctive flag. Many of those flags have survived and are now at the Ohio History Connection. We head over there now to take a look at their collection. So Ben, we're here at the Ohio History Connection where you collect items from all different decades. And we're actually in a gallery right now that has some Civil War memorabilia. Can you tell me what I'm seeing here? Yes, this gallery is called Follow the Flags. It highlights our large collection of battle flags. We have over 560 battle flags in our collection that range from the Mexican-American War all the way up to World War II. About 400 of those are, are from the Civil War. So this gallery really highlights those battle flags. What is a battle flag and what was it used for in the Civil War? Each regiment in the Civil War would carry a battle flag. They would have normally two flags, a national flag that looked like the national flag um, of that time. They also would carry a regimental flag, which would highlight their specific regiment. There were about 200 uh, regiments from Ohio during the Civil War. It was a, an honor to be the, the flag bearer because you carried the flag and that actually allowed people in your regiment to see where they were supposed to go, follow battle orders, that sort of thing. Now I know you have some flags that we don't see on display in these cabinets. Can you show them to me? Yes, I definitely can. All right, Let let's go. Let me open it up. Wow, this is a beautiful flag. I can't believe this is from the Civil War. So what regiment was this from? This actually was from the 44th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, the OVI. They were formed in Springfield, Ohio. Now, I know that these are all sort of connected to Ohio, but I see Virginia on that. What does that mean? Right, these are the battle honors. So after the battle, the people in the regiment would go back and add the different battles that they fought in. So you see here the Siege of Knoxville, Surrender of Cumberland Gap, Lewisburg, Virginia. These were all battles that this specific regiment served in. And what are these made out of? It looks like there's some paint, but is it, is it just fabric? Yeah, actually, the majority of the flags are made of silk. Um, there's a couple made of wool, uh, but silk was more, uh, more used widely at that time. And then the, the battle honors were actually sewn on later on. The flags were made by um, factories that produced these flags for the different regiments, but actually the battle honors were added later on by members of the regiment. Great, well this is a gorgeous flag. Do you have more to show me? Yeah, I can show you another one. That is amazing, the reds and the blues. Mm -hmm. So which, what flag is this from? Uh, this is actually from the 56th uh, OVI. I believe they were formed in Portsmouth, Ohio. Again, you can see the different battles that they served in. This is actually an example of a national flag. Uh, this flag was most likely made in New York. You can tell by the, the kind of square canton, the blue field there, that indicates that it was made at a surplus station in, in New York. So you said you knew that was in New York. Um, how do you know? The flags were made in either one of three cities. The majority of the flags we have were made in Cincinnati. Uh, the second most that we have were made in Philadelphia, and then we have several that were made in New York as well. But there's certain things you can see um, on the national flags, the way that the, the canton, the square there, looks, that kind of is an indication of where it came from. They just made them a certain way in each different city. The regimental flags, you can tell by the way the stars are patterned, where they came from. Wonderful. Can I see the next one? Yeah. Now that's a lot of blue. <laughs> and that eagle, you can see some of the definition. I mean, was that just a matter of really well-made embroidery or what? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. This one actually features embroidery, which is a little different than the other ones. Um, that indicates that this flag was made in Cincinnati. That's the only city that used embroidery. This is from the 12th OVI. Uh, they were formed in uh, Cincinnati at Camp Denison. Now, how have you been able to track, like, kind of the history of these flags and where they came from? Sure, yeah. After the Civil War, 
Um, each of these flags went back to the state of Ohio. They were actually uh, stored at the Ohio State House. And whenever uh, reunion groups would get together, Civil War reunion groups, they would actually come to the State House and they could check out their flag, kind of like a library, basically. Um, and so they didn't keep the best care of the flags, or sometimes the flags weren't returned at all. But in the 1960s, they actually decided they should try to take better care of them. Um, they removed them from the State House. They actually glued them down. They were glued to nylon with an adhesive called polyvinyl alcohol, and uh, that helped keep them together. It's not the best way to preserve a flag, but that's what they did in the 1960s. And then for many years, they actually hanged here in the main rotunda at the Ohio History Center. Uh, they took them down in the 1980s and put them in storage and, and put a few out here on exhibit. And so you talked about the adhesive. I mean, what were the pros and cons on this end of history of using that? Um, it did help in some regards because a lot of the flags were in very bad condition and very tattered, and so gluing it down helped keep it together. But over time, that glue can eat away at the silk and, and damage the flag. We have these um, uh, preserved. They get sent off to a, a company that, that does all that. They actually uh, remove all that glue. They have to soak these flags. It gets the glue away. They then add kind of a sheer fabric on, on the front and the back of the flags. It's called staple tex. And they sew the fabric around the edges of the flag. Um, and so that's a better method of, of preserving the flags. That's really fascinating. Well, this is another beautiful flag. Can I see in the next one? Sure, yeah. Now this is a little bit different. I mean, it looks like a flag, but it looks almost like it's made from a different fabric than the other one. Yeah, I believe this one is, is made of wool as well, so you can tell it's in a little bit better condition. This one is actually from the 51st OVI, actually formed in Dover, Ohio, at uh, Camp Miggs. And you can tell by the, the kind of rectangular field there that this one was also made in Cincinnati. So how has this flag been able to maintain its colors? I would guess the material uh, being made of wool helped it retain its colors a little better than some of the other ones. Well, that's interesting. Um, all right, well, can we see the next one? Sure. Huh, this is a little bit different. This one actually has some stuff missing on it. So what yes. happened here? <laughs> well, yeah, this, a lot of this uh, was very detailed work, and so over time, that just chips away and falls off. You can see this one has been glued onto the nylon, so that's the nylon that you're seeing underneath there. Can you tell me a little bit more about the background of this flag and where it came from? Yes, this uh, flag was carried by the 36th OVI. Uh, they were formed in Marietta. This shows some of the battles that they fought in. Some of the more famous battles are Antietam. Um, at the top there, it mentions Bull Run. Uh, that would have been the second battle of Bull Run. Wow. This has got a rich history in it, doesn't it? Yes, and then you can see a lot of these battles were later in the war, 1864. So were these regiments, were they all kind of formed at different times? They're... That's a good question. Um, yeah, usually the regiments were formed and they only signed up for like three months. A lot of people thought the Civil War wasn't going to last that long, so they would muster in for about three months. But once the war was continuing, uh, they got people to sign up for another three years. So that got them to 1864, but even at that point, the war was still going on, and so they had to convince a lot of these regiments to then serve for another year. In 1864, if you could get half of your regiment to re-sign back up, then you would get veteran status, and then you'd get all the veteran benefits. Ah. So there were incentives to continue to fight in the war. So tell me a little bit more about Ohio's role in the Civil War. Were there battles fought here? Uh, no, no major battles were, were fought in Ohio. Um, there was a, a minor skirmish in uh, Bluffington Island, which is down on the Ohio River, but that was kind of the major one. But Ohio did supply about 330,000 soldiers in the Civil War, which is the highest per capita of any, any state in the Union. Well, can we see another one? Sure. Okay, here's another regimental flag. This one's from the 35th Regiment, and they were formed in Hamilton, Ohio. And this is the, the seal of the United States. If you see a dollar bill, most people recognize that eagle. It's holding an olive branch in one talon and, and arrows in the other. The eagle is facing towards an olive branch because the U.S. favors peace, even though these were used, uh, of course, during, during battles. Can you tell me some of the ways you at Ohio History Connection 
try to preserve these the best way you can. Well, we keep them um, in storage. Uh, people love to see these battle flags, but the biggest thing that can damage the flags is, is light. So having them out on exhibit over time can, can damage them. So that's why in this gallery, we actually rotate the flags. They're only out for a certain amount of time, and then we put new ones out. So we're rotating them all the time. There's humidity issues. We try to keep it kind of a stable humidity level, temperature level, uh, anything we can to help uh, preserve these. And by preservation, we're not trying to restore these flags to how they originally looked. We just want to keep them how they are, and, and hopefully they won't deteriorate any further. That's wonderful. Can I see another one? Yep. This is a little flag, yeah. very tiny flag. <laughs> right. how, how is this one different than the rest? This one's a little different, you can tell. Uh, this is called a guidon. Uh, it's sort of like a pennant. Uh, shaped flag. This is actually used by a, a cavalry unit, so soldiers on horseback um, trying to carry a large six by six battle flag would be difficult on horseback. They kind of uh, act like sails and would kind of they'd blow you around. So uh, this is the typical type of flag that was carried by a cavalry unit. This one was actually used by the uh, 13th Ohio Voluntary Cavalry. And they were formed in Warren County. All right, well, I'd love to see something now. Sure. This uh, flag was carried by a regiment from Cincinnati, and they trained at Camp Denison. This one is actually from um, a battery that was part of the artillery. Uh, this is the, the first uh, Ohio Voluntary Artillery Unit, uh, so they were in charge of, of cannons. Usually light artillery, so kind of the, the smaller cannons that you could cart around easier. There weren't as many artillery units uh, as infantry from Ohio, but this is one of the, the batteries carried this flag. So you've talked about a, a few different kinds of regiments. How many different kinds of regiments were there in the Civil War? Yeah, there was basically three types of, of regiments. Infantry, which was the majority, that's the infantry soldier, that's your, your basic soldier. Um, and then you have cavalry units, and those are on horseback. And then you have artillery, which is cannons. Can I see another one? Yeah. It's missing something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not in the best of shape. This is from the uh, 89th Regiment, which uh, was also formed in, in Cincinnati. They were actually in the Atlanta campaign, serving in Georgia. Somehow this flag got captured by a Confederate unit. Um, one of the members, actually in 1880, went and somehow retrieved the flag from whoever had it in Georgia. This flag stayed in their family for generations. Ultimately, that family donated the flag to the Daughters of the American Revolution, but uh, they found out quickly that you can't actually own one of these flags. These belong to the state of Ohio. Uh, we actually don't own them ourselves. We just, we curate them, but they belong to the state. And so they worked with us and, 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 and brought the flag here. So how can people see these flags that are kind of in storage? Do you have special events or anything? We do often uh, periodically have uh, special events where we open up the cabinets and, and show people the flags and, and talk about them. And there are several of the flags on, on exhibit in this gallery at all times. Well, that's amazing that you've been able to keep a hold of these. So thank you so much for showing us these flags. I hope people can come in and look at them for themselves because you really can't imagine what they look like until you actually see it. So thank you for sharing this. Sure, with us. yeah, no problem. Thank you. During the American Civil War, many soldiers learned a new game from some of the New York City regiments. When the war was over, these young men were eager to take that game back to their hometowns. And in 1866, baseball clubs started springing up all over, including here in Columbus. We checked in with local historian Joe Santry to tell us more. The 1800s were really the beginning, and baseball evolved. Every year, the rules changed a little, the players got better, the ballparks got better. This was what set up it becoming the national pastime. It was the work of these early pioneers. Baseball began around 1845 as a New York game. It remained a regional pastime until the Civil War, when soldiers from all over embraced it as a way to kill time when they were in camp. 
Every town formed a team. Now Columbus, the first team created was the Columbus Buckeyes. And they played the first recorded game on April 6th, 1866 at Parsons and Broad Street, which was the grounds of the Franklin County Insane Asylum. And the first team beat the second team 95 to 44. Six teams were organized that first year. The names of some city leaders who played are recognizable today. Chittenden, Neal, Dennison, and King, for instance. People from all walks of life joined the teams. One of the teams, the Capitals, had a young man named P.W. P.W. always batted last, and he always played right field. At the end of the season, he gets called into the manager's office, and, and we were imagining what it would be like. Uh, P.W., thanks for coming out. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We hope you had fun, too. But don't quit your day job. So he created a bank. His name was P.W. Huntington. Now, the guy who always batted ninth has his name above the ballpark. Columbus had six teams when the National League was formed in 1876, but when they were trounced by a team from Cincinnati, they decided to consolidate so they could be more competitive. Jimmy Williams organized the Columbus Buckeyes, an all-professional team. In 1877, the Buckeyes played in a seven-city league with teams in the United States and Canada that Williams created. In 1883, Columbus made the big leagues. Williams secured a franchise for the Columbus Buckeyes when the American Association expanded from six to eight teams. Well, the first year they didn't do really well, but uh, the second year they finished in second. On that team was uh, Eddie Cannonball Morris. He was the greatest left-handed pitcher of the 1800s. He was one of the very first pitchers to throw overhand. He threw overhanded and uh, the umpire read the rule book and he goes, doesn't say he can't do it. And when he stood on Recreation Park's pitching square, he faced west. And so when he threw the ball, it came out of the south. One of the local sports writers called him a southpaw. And the name has stuck for every lefty ever since. One of my very favorite people on the Buckeyes team his name was Eddie Dummy Dundon, which was sort of an irony. They weren't really politically correct passing out the nicknames in the 1880s, but the irony was is he was actually the valedictorian of his school, the Ohio School for the Deaf and Dumb. Dumb meaning not that you weren't intelligent, but that you couldn't speak because you couldn't hear. Their philosophy was to raise deaf children as closely as they could to hearing children. Well, that included playing sports. So they formed the very first Ohio high school baseball team. Of course, there was nobody to play. There no other high school had a team. So they played the colleges, Ohio State, Ohio Wesleyan, and they got pretty good. And they traveled the eastern United States, and they actually beat major league teams. Eddie was the first to play in the majors, but he had a problem. When he would slide into second base, he couldn't hear if he was out or he was safe. So he worked out some hand signals with the umpires. They might go, you know, whoa, Eddie, stop there, you're all right. Or, Eddie, you're out, go back to the bench. Well, he played for 10 years and his teammates played for even longer. Now they go, you're safe and you're out, all because of their handicaps. The 1883 and 84 Buckeyes, we were arrested for playing baseball on Sunday. There was a big, big meeting at City Hall, and on one side of the aisle were all the pro baseball people, and all the other ones were the pro blue law people, and it was almost violent. And finally, a very elderly man stood up. His name was William Deschler, of the Deschler Hotel fame. And he stood up and goes, gentlemen, this is ridiculous. He goes, how about if the players agree not to play on Sunday, we let them out of jail and we'll just forget the whole thing. And they did. But the problem was, is in 1884, everybody worked six days a week. And Sunday was the only day they had free to go to a ball game. So the finances of the team went right in the dumper. In 1896 through 1899,
Columbus played baseball in the Western League, a high minor league. In 99, there were hints that the National League was going to drop four teams and go back to an eight-team league. The man who ran the Western League was named Ban Johnson, and he takes the Columbus team to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is in the low minors, and took the low minors Grand Rapids team and brought them to Columbus. Well, this angered the Columbus fans. In 1899, the National League had a message for four teams. You're out. The Western League moved into those cities and was renamed the American League. By 1901, it was considered a major league. And that former Columbus team that was moved to Grand Rapids, they made one more move. And today, they're called the Cleveland Indians. For as long as I can remember, being from Ohio was interchangeable with being a Buckeye. But one viewer asked if the origin story about Ohioans first being called Buckeyes, all the way back in the late 1700s, is the actual story. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm curious to find out. WOSU's Curious Seabus answers your questions about our region, its history, and its people. Today, Ohioans wear the nickname Buckeye with pride. But how did this strange nut become so beloved in the first place? Well, it turns out that the origin story we've been told again and again for generations might just be a tall tale. We asked historian Raymond Irwin to tell us more. The nickname as applied to human beings comes from an historian, Samuel Prescott Hildreth, who wrote a book in 1852 in which he claimed that the nickname comes from a early settler named Ebenezer Sprout, who was a colonel in the militia and led the procession at the first court in Washington County in September 1788. From there, the story goes that some friendly indigenous peoples were there and shouted the name Hetok at him, which the white settlers translated at the time as Big Eye of the Buck because Sprout was six foot four and well built. And the idea is that that nickname then became applied to other settlers in Marietta and then applied to people from Ohio from there on. The real story though, is that um, Hildreth made up the story. And we know this because Hetuck has no relationship to Buckeye. And as a matter of fact, uh, after some digging in the native languages, I discovered that it probably comes from the Lenape word or Delaware word for hicktock, which just means tree. And so at a, at a dinner in 1792, uh, the captain of the Delaware peoples, the Lenape peoples, uh, was commenting on Sprout's size. And he said, that guy basically is as big as a tree. And that's probably where it came from. The actual origins of the Buckeye nickname are much more complicated because in the early 19th century, the word Buckeye was an insult. It meant fake or false or shoddy. And it comes from the fact that the Buckeye tree produces wood that is very poor quality, or at least they thought it was poor quality. Eventually though, the Buckeye becomes kind of rehabilitated in the first two decades of the 19th century. And the, the white settlers discover that Buckeye wood is actually not a bad thing. They start making spoons out of it and plates and things like that. And they discover certain medicinal qualities from the nut, which indigenous peoples had known for a long time, but the white settlers discovered kind of later on. And so the name Buckeye then became applied to humans, we think, in the 18 teens and 1820s. And it meant essentially a person from the West or someone from the frontier. It wasn't initially applied to people from Ohio at all until we think the late 1820s, early 1830s, and by 1833, Daniel Drake, who was a physician from Cincinnati, uses the term Buckeye to apply to people born in Ohio. In the 1830s, there are several things that imbue uh, certain positive characteristics. For example, one of the gubernatorial candidates, Wilson Shannon, was the first candidate born in Ohio, 1802. He used Buckeye as a campaign nickname. Around the same time, there was the war between Michigan and Ohio over the strip of land that included uh, Toledo. And that was because the canals were, were projected to go up to Lake Erie. Michigan claimed it. Ohio objected. Governor Lucas sent militia. Michigan sent its own militia. And there was a war. And Governor Lucas used the word Buckeye to be kind of like a battle cry. The Buckeyes will not be intimidated. 
And then in 1836, William Henry Harrison uses the Buckeye theme for his own presidential candidacy, which is successful four years later. And in fact, in 1840, the log cabin campaign, the log cabin is made of Buckeye wood. So you go from uh, an insult in the 18 teens to something of immense pride in the 1830s, a very quick turnaround for the Buckeye. Do you have a question for Curious Seabus? Head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. But not always so still And look, there's some wet on my feet here on heel Someday I'll find